Hey there students and thank you for joining me to go over the Compromise of 1850. And before we do that, I want to thank Casey and her friends at Joplin High School in Mr. Kez's AP US History class. Thank you so much for the support on Twitter and thank you for letting me know that you need help with this topic. So the Compromise of 1850, first of all, let's go ahead and set up a little context. Our context here is the Mexican-American War. And what are we going to do with all of this land, the Mexican cession, which we got from the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Now, of course, there are all kinds of debates about how fair that was. That's not a question we're going to tackle here. But of course, there were all kinds of proposals that were put forward from extending the Missouri Compromise Line to the Pacific, or the Wilmot Proviso, which said that their Wilmot, get it? <laughs> okay. All right. But their Wilmot not be slavery in the Mexican session at all. So you had free soilers who were thinking, hey, enough of this. Because before the Mexican-American War and before that, the annexation of Texas, there was this whole idea about a parity, an even amount of slave and free states, a tit-for-tat sort of thing. But now with the free soil movement, that is impossible. And so we see the first impasse, all right? So Henry Clay had been able to negotiate some compromises in the past. He had been able to uh, do the Missouri Compromise. He'd been able to broker a compromise for nullification. Now, this is Henry Clay's third and final compromise, but we can't give him all the credit. It was kind of a shake and bake operation. Stephen Douglas helped too. Stephen Douglas, who was a Democratic senator, from Illinois and of course someone who would be a very major figure in the 1850s as a democratic politician but Henry Clay came up with the idea for the compromise and Stephen Douglas had to do a lot of the work because let's face it Henry Clay's old and he's dying even though that doesn't technically happen until a couple years later but Henry Clay doesn't have the same energy that he used to have. And so as far as the Compromise of 1850, this was a large legislative package that was made up of five parts. And it's very important that we understand the intricacies of this because they could be easily oversimplified and misunderstood and then bam, you missed something on a test question or you got something wrong on one of your essays. So listen up. So first of all, admit California as a free state. Now, this is something that was not very popular with the Southern political class because California is geographically, and of course today as far as population as well, a very large state. And so since California is such a large state, the Southern congressmen, they were thinking, well, why can't we divide this into two states? And there was a lot of opposition to admitting this large free state into the Union. So something else is going to have to be done. So something's got to be done for some of these Southern congressmen to come aboard. Now, so what they do is, especially for these congressmen in the Upper South, if we think about Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware, a stronger fugitive slave law. Now, this is not something that the political class of South Carolina or Alabama really cared about because they're in the Deep South. But the state States in the Upper South, they wanted this protection from the federal government for fugitive slaves because previously there had been a fugitive slave law, but it was something that was handled by the states. And what was going on was several of the northern states by this time, they had stopped enforcing this law. So the stronger fugitive slave law placed the federal government in charge of enforcement. And, of course, there were some very controversial aspects of this law, such as the lack of a jury trial and the payment that a judge got that was extra if the accused was found guilty. Of course, this was technically because of additional paperwork that had to be filled out, but it certainly didn't look good politically. And so the stronger fugitive slave law, you need to understand that there was already a previous fugitive slave law and also know that this was by far the most controversial provision of the Compromise of 1850. So that's the second one. Now then we go on to how are we going to settle slavery in the Mexican session? So admit California is a free state, but what about the New Mexico and Utah territories? Well, what is 
put forward here by Lewis Cass and Stephen Douglas is this idea of popular sovereignty, sometimes known as squatter sovereignty. And so instead of Congress deciding that this is going to be a slave territory or free territory, then let the settlers have a vote once we get some settlers there and let them decide. So popular sovereignty, and of course that term has a lot of meanings outside of this, but when we're talking about antebellum politics, popular sovereignty, or squatter sovereignty means that the settlers in the territory will decide. And of course, this is going to be tried again later in the Kansas-Nebraska Act with disastrous results. But it doesn't really cause a lot of trouble here, and it gives Congress one less thing to argue about because they don't have to make that decision. Now, as far as that goes, though, we've got another question out west that Texas was actually claiming a lot more land than the federal government recognized. All right. So Texas claimed land all the way to Santa Fe, New Mexico, what is today Santa Fe. And so there was a serious impasse here between Texas and the federal government. And finally, they settled it the way the federal government tends to settle just about any conflict with the states money all right so they made it rain 10 million dollars to help texas pay their war debt and so texas took the money took the 10 million dollars kind of a bailout if you will and they renounced the claims north of 3630 and in the regions that were claimed by the united states government as part of the new mexico territory And then finally, while we're at it, everything so far has been out west, but it's one of those things kind of like if you're in an argument with a friend and you've laid all this stuff out, a knockdown drag out, and finally, okay, is there anything else? While we've got everything on the table, is there anything else we need to talk about? Well, you know there is. I've got plenty of funny stories like that that I could tell, but it has nothing to do with U.S. history. And so abolish the slave trade in Washington, D.C. Now, this was a compromise between people who wanted to abolish slavery outright, and then, of course, the Southern congressmen, they would bring their slaves to D.C. with them. Uh, each of them would have what was called a body man, somebody who helped them get dressed in the morning, cooked their meals, saw to it that they got the newspaper and all of this other stuff, did their laundry. And so the slave trade was a special embarrassment for the United States because because keep in mind that you've got foreign dignitaries, ambassadors, visitors from other countries, and they're walking by slave auctions, you know, 20, give me 25, 30, and, and just very embarrassing for the United States. So in order to compromise on that issue, they didn't outlaw slavery entirely, but outlaw the slave trade in Washington, D.C. to lessen the embarrassment of the United States on the international stage. And so a quick review here. Now, I find that we don't remember things in five. So I've cut this down into twos. And of course, you've got slavery in Washington, D.C. So first of all, for the North, all right, you admit California as a free state. For the South, a stronger fugitive slave law. So you've got this trade between the North and the South. Now, then the New Mexico Territory, popular sovereignty in the Mexican session, and then Texas will cede their western land claims in return for the federal assumption of Texas debt. And then finally, slavery in Washington, D.C., the slave trade is abolished, but slavery itself remains legal at this point in the nation's capital. And so with that, this is the Mexican session before. You see all that land that Texas is claiming. And then this is what's going on after. Texas gave up some land. California is admitted as a free state. And then the Utah and New Mexico territories are created in terms of popular sovereignty when it comes to whether slavery will exist in those territories or not. Now, as far as this package of legislation. It was somewhat controversial. Now, Daniel Webster from Massachusetts, who was nearing the end of his life, I mean, the great triumvirate of the antebellum period, Webster, Clay, and Calhoun, they're all old. This is really all of their 
kind of last hurrah sort of scenario here, Daniel Webster delivered his 7th of March speech where he tried to find common ground between the North and the South and actually chastised the North. Now, Daniel Webster was no friend of slavery, but as a lawyer, one of the greatest lawyers of that time, he said that the North has a legal obligation to return slaves. And if Northern states are not doing that, then as he put it, the North is wrong and the South is right on this. Now, of course, this was not well received by his constituents and he ended up resigning from the Senate in order to become Secretary of State. John Greenleaf Whittier, an abolitionist poet, wrote a poem called Ichabod, which comes from word in the Old Testament meaning without glory. And so Daniel Webster did something that he thought was going to help things. And, and really, this is one of those things that JFK um, in the book uh, Profiles and Courage, which uh, of course a guy helped, uh, was kind of shaking and bake operation as well, kind of like Henry Clay and Stephen Douglas. But Daniel Webster is identified as one of these courageous senators, somebody who did something that he thought was the right thing against the will of his constituents. Henry Clay, of course, was putting this together, so of course he was for it. John C. Calhoun was against it, and there were several Southern senators who were against it, especially those in the Democratic Party. And Calhoun felt like the South had compromised already on things, had seen uh, those compromises gone back on, especially with the tariff, and he believed that the South was on the verge of compromising itself out of existence. And he even forecasted that should this pass, he foresaw a civil war in about 10 years. Well, that's pretty much what happened. Uh, so the guy may have been a, a racist, but also a genius. Uh, so prophetic, all right? But the thing is that it was not something that was universally acceded to. And Henry Clay, of course, was working hard to get this done, but let's not forget the work of Stephen Douglas, that it was so controversial that a big bill could not be passed. A single legislative package could not be passed. And Stephen Douglas had to put together a majority, a separate majority for all five bills so that they could pass. So quite a legislative maneuver on Stephen Douglas's part, who will then go on to become famous in the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And you can see him over here that in some of these monuments to the Lincoln-Douglas debates, you notice that Lincoln is seated because Stephen Douglas was so short compared to Lincoln that Lincoln just towered over him. So um, interesting how they designed this monument here. But yes, that is the same Stephen Douglas as the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And Stephen Douglas will become pretty much uh, synonymous with the doctrine of popular sovereignty in the 1850s as the main sponsor of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And so a crisis is averted here, at least for that time. Now, Henry Clay thought that this is going to be the compromise to end all compromises. And in a way it is, but not in the way that Henry Clay thought that it was going to be, not in the way that he anticipated that this Fugitive Slave Act was going to cause a great deal of controversy. And then, of course, when the second party system falls apart and the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and it just starts spiraling out of control. So the Compromise of 1850 is a very important turning point in the history of the United States because it marks really the end of the old political culture of the antebellum period, that 1812 generation and that was based on compromise and it's moving toward this uh you know this no compromise attitude that's based on majoritarian politics and sectional politics and a lack of compromise so the crisis was averted for a time all right but the 1850s are a ticking time bomb in u.s history uh the greatest period of political polarization that we have ever experienced in this country of course at this time we might be kind of rivaling it but i don't think we're coming anywhere close and so in 1850 we're shaking hands in 1860 We'll all be shooting at each other. And so while this compromise uh, was something that solved some of the problems that existed at the time, it created new ones and did not solve the sectional issues. And in fact, in the 1850s, they're going to get worse.
I wish I had better news for you, but there are some pretty uh, tumultuous parts of our history. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already, and check me out on social media, and of course I have a website. It's always a pleasure.